Amy, good to see you. Hey, wonderful to meet you. Let's uh, walk over here. I spoke with Amy at the Aspen Ideas Climate Festival in Miami Beach, Florida. Amy was one of the speakers at the event. Her biggest task is now keeping the roads dry as the flooding comes from rain, the tides, and the rising groundwater underneath the city. Let me uh, go back in time to little Amy. As mm -hmm. a, a child, uh, I'm sure you weren't saying, Mommy, Daddy, I want to be a chief resilience yeah. officer since there was no such thing. But, yeah. but talk to me about uh, your childhood. What sent you on this path to the role that you're in today? Yeah. Well, I mean, my, my father is an avid gardener, and I was always sort of um, seeing him in the garden and, and having that appreciation for nature. Um, you know, we would save up all of our magazines and drive them to the, you know, recycling center to drop off. There was no curbside pickup, you know, at that time. Um, I remember when I was about five, we had a pretty, pretty big flood and seeing the water um, about halfway up the, the windows in our dining room and, um, you know, jumping onto the bucket of that the firemen brought to kind of get us out of there. And, um, you know, I think that those moments stuck with me um, for sure. Um, and I'm originally from upstate New York. It's very beautiful. And as I began to study these issues, um, I began learning about sea level rise and sort of this flip side of these issues we face, that there was a tremendous amount of risk and that relationship with the sustainability side, with the resilience side, and the need to really protect ourselves. Um, and so I started as a regulator, um, came down to Miami, and I thought it was fascinating because I got to learn uh, Miami like the back of my hand. I understood why sewage systems are important, why um, stormwater systems are, are important, their ability to pollute, their ability to protect us. And um, it was really important, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't innovative. It was a lot of more just a regulatory focus. And so I began to move out of that space. Um, I went to University of Miami. I got my executive um, master's in business administration because I wanted to do much more uh, with the information that I had and the tools I had. Um, so that led me to do strategic planning for the environmental department um, in Miami-Dade, which was a great, uh, I would say, sort of partnership. Uh, I worked on the first sustainability plan. I led that planning process for Miami-Dade County. Um, and then, you know, eventually had the opportunity to come here and sort of put it all together um, with the Chief Resilience Officer work. Before becoming the Chief Resilience Officer of Miami Beach, Amy worked in a similar role as Structural Innovation Manager at the City of Fort Lauderdale. I, I want to get your thoughts on a couple of things I heard yesterday. One is that you you can't put off paying your taxes. You got to pay your taxes. Yeah. Uh, we got to, and, and this is a tax, or, or it should be viewed that way. We've got to address this now. You got to pay. Um, I heard somebody else say yesterday, this is the decade of decisions. We've got to really start moving and accelerating our pace. But I've also heard people say, look, uh, we shouldn't have a fear of failure. We should try a bunch of different things, and if we fail, you know, some of those things are going to work. We need to think outside the box. So give me your take on all of those different points of view, because I thought they were all rather interesting. Hmm. Well, I think every city is different, and um, Miami Beach is just so incredibly vulnerable. So we have to do all of that. I mean, we have um, very good information about how vulnerable we are. We're about 4.5 feet um, above sea level. Uh, we are, as you can see, we're a beautiful, thriving city. We have a lot of people. We have a lot of assets to protect. So we have to do something right now. We have to invest. Um, we've invested about 200 million in climate adaptation projects already, and we have many more um, in the hopper, if you will. And they range from road elevation to new stormwater systems, larger stormwater systems, um, fortifying our nature-based infrastructure, like our dune system, which is about seven miles of amazing protection. Um, and incorporating green infrastructure wherever possible as we you know, rebuild our, our seawalls. Um, but more importantly, we want our city to be enjoyable now and to be beautiful and to improve quality of life. So we're sort of investing and improving, and that's our approach. Uh, we don't have time to wait, and uh, we are learning. I mean, we're learning all the time. We're learning from others. I've traveled internationally. Uh, we're constantly hosting other cities for tours on the work that we've done. And I think that our approach has changed. Uh, many years ago with the first project, um, it was done on an emergency basis. Um, Sunset Harbor was flooding from sunny day flooding. And um, our prior mayor very famously sort of floated on his kayak with his dog on it and uh, on his campaign trail. 
And so that neighborhood was quickly addressed. Um, and we did a lot of things right there. But what we've done since then is a more holistic approach to planning. We've done um, much more co-design with the community to make sure that they're part of the decisions being made. And we have made sure we're addressing things like our transportation master plan that prioritizes pedestrians. So wherever we can, we're adding in bike lanes, we're uh, widening sidewalks, we are integrating um, a more resilient urban tree canopy. So we're trying to do all of those important things that are also priorities of the city. Somebody I spoke to yesterday said uh, Miami Beach has a choice, you know, like we can address these issues and really confront them or we can just be like Venice mm -hmm. and we're not going to be like Venice. We're going to mm -hmm. we're going to get out there. and We're going to fight. And it's interesting because you were talking about your former mayor being in the kayak with the dog. And that's mm -hmm. that's very visual. And you can say if you're a resident, wow, we've got a bit of a crisis. But there are other parts of the United States where the mayor's not going to get in a kayak. Mm -hmm. And you have other parts of the United States and other parts of the world where people are like, climate change isn't a thing. What do you say to those people? And, and how much of that is an impediment on our efforts to really overcome this crisis? Well, I think it's important to be really informed. You know, we are fortunate that we have something called the Southeast Florida Climate Change Compact. And this is a group of government professionals such as myself that have come together, you know, with other groups from universities and um, produced information that's critical and it's trusted because it's local. So they created um, sea level rise projections for Southeast Florida that we have adopted as a city to use for planning. And it's not an argument so much of whether or not um, this is occurring or whether or not we should do this. We've made a decision to adapt. We are either going to incrementally adapt to this or we should be planning to re for retreat. It's pretty much irresponsible to do, I think, anything in the middle. So um, I'm, I'm so proud to work for a city that has made that decision. Um, it's built into our long-term planning. It's built into our shorter-term planning. And it's, it's difficult. It's very challenging because we have neighborhoods that maybe aren't flooding frequently but are still at risk. Um, so we want to do that advanced planning because we want to avoid all the damage that we know that can happen. Um, but, you know, Miami Beach is no stranger to risk. We have hurricanes um, and people understand hurricanes and they understand the volume of water that brings. So for us, I think we have an innate kind of understanding of what can happen and um, the devastation that can occur. And it's so much, so much better to invest ahead and to avoid um, that damage and reduce risk. Climate change remains an existential threat to Miami, with its effects increasingly apparent today. The city's surrounding waters rose six inches within the past 25 years, some of the fastest rates globally. Your mayor likes to play basketball, he talks about yeah. that, uh, but I think he would even acknowledge, and he's, you know, he's a little bit up there in age, his knees hurt after playing basketball, he was telling mm -hmm. me the other day, but he's still pretty good at it. He would acknowledge that if he had to go up against LeBron James, that uh, he'd be outmatched and it would be pretty tough. Uh, that's a tough adversary. But your adversary is much tougher. It's Mother Nature. Uh, are there days when you're just like, wow, this is really a tough job? Or is it something you embrace? Uh, mm -hmm. Talk to me about the adversity of being in your role. As he said, uh, you're a canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, a, it's not an easy job, I wouldn't think. It's not simple and it wakes me up at night uh, for sure, uh, many times. Um, but I do feel uh, proud of the amount of planning that we've done and it sort of helps I think with that stress and that anxiety, if you will. We're doing so many different levels of planning and um, I think that that's incredibly helpful because none of us really know sort of what the city is gonna look like in the next 50, 100 years. We don't know what our country is gonna look like. So we all have to be comfortable with some of the uncomfortable nature of just the future. You know, we don't know what's gonna be happening with our families in the next 10, 20, 30 years. So all we can do is do our best every single day, you know, put our heads down and work and work as hard as we can on it. So that's my approach. Um, and you know, we've seen a lot of success. We've seen good results. Um, in the first neighborhood that we adapted, we have you know, over 100 avoided tidal flooding incidents that we would have seen water in the streets had we not done the work. So that's helpful to see that, that success. And when we do the work, the projects, you know, they're beautiful and they're making neighborhoods better. And that is, I think, rewarding as well. Um, we don't know what the city is gonna look like. And so that is um, both a little unnerving, but also exciting and it is innovative. And cities change. I mean, cities all over the world are 
um, layered cities. They evolve over time. They have old buildings next to new buildings. They have different heights. Um, cities have hills. We don't even have any hills. We're just very flat, you know. And so we're. Um, it's going to be a different place, but I don't think it's something that we should be prepared or that we should not be prepared for, should I say. I think that we shouldn't be afraid. I think we continue to invest and work hard. Our network uh, does something called the Global Action Initiative, where we look at an issue that's facing everyone around the globe. Uh, a couple years ago, we focused on poverty. Last year was climate change. This year, we're talking about sustainability. Uh, we only do these minor things that are really easy to kind of deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> what does sustainability mean to you, and, and why is that an important word in the world that we live in today? Mm. Well, I started my career, you know, very much focused on the sustainability aspect of this field. Um, you know, environmental policy has traditionally been very centered on that. And it's, it's, it's kind of the foundation, you know, it's the flip side to the coin of resilience, that we, we need to do everything we can to reduce these risks and to better our quality of life. And we have a responsibility for that, especially with how vulnerable we are. So we are also leading, you know, in that area. We um, we're a city that you know has has um, really banned the use of plastic straws. We have done so much in transitioning our fleet to EV. We're creating the EV infrastructure, electric vehicle. Um, we're planting uh, about 5,000 trees over the next few years to increase our canopy. So we're doing a lot from the perspective of making sure we take care of our environment, that we're not contributing to the overall problem. And our environment is beautiful and it's right next to us. And it's uh, such a treasured part of why people move here. So really protecting the environment first and the decisions we make is very important. Sometimes green solutions have unintended consequences. A surprising new study based on four decades of tropical cyclone activity reveals that reducing particulate air pollution in Europe and North America has actually contributed to an increase of tropical hurricanes in the North Atlantic. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, my kids are really proud of me and they're very supportive um, and they love the work that we do and it's dinner table talk at all times. Um, and I would say sometimes they're a little frustrated. They, I bring home sort of my challenges at work and they say, well, how can there be any issue of addressing these? You know, how can there be any sort of hesitancy? Like you have to do it. Like you have to do this work, you know, for the next generation. So I think there's a sense of urgency that is really, really strong in the next generation. And I see that in my kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This. Well, the next generation is um, extremely well prepared. And I will tell you when I receive at resumes now from, um, you know, job applicants coming out of school, their, uh, their education is centered on these issues. They're working on sustainability. They're working on resilience. They understand the climate change threats that we have. And it's um, really outstanding to see this level of workforce coming in. And I have really, really high hopes for that. Communities around the world are finding creative ways to tackle greenhouse gas emissions. Lake Kivu in East Africa covers a bed of so much toxic methane that it's called a killer lake. Each eruption of the nearby Niragungo volcano raises fears that the gas may escape and poison the neighboring towns and cities. But the energy firm Kivuwa saw an opportunity transforming the gas into electricity that powers almost a third of Rwanda. I looked up resilient in the dictionary, able to withstand or recover quickly from difficult conditions. Are we responding and recovering quickly enough? I mean, just listening to you, I mean, I think what you just described, I think people recognize that maybe that's the future, but we'd kind of try and, you know, try and act like it's not coming. Is there enough of a sense of urgency out there? Well, this conference, I mean, there's an incredible sense of urgency. 
You know, on the day-to-day -day basis, are people prioritizing this, you know, right at the top? You know, I'm not sure. I think people have day-to-day -day concerns of getting through, um, you know, their family needs, their work needs. We have commute times. We've got congestion. And um, is it the top thing of mind? Probably not. I mean, should it be? Yeah, a little bit more. I think it's really, really important to be prepared. Um, but South Florida is not normal in that we've had, you know, major hurricanes that have shaped how we build. So we build very differently than the rest of the state and the rest of the country. You know, we're built for category five hurricanes, right? So we already have, um, I would say, some foresight and, and an acknowledgement that it's really, really important to prepare. Um, I do know people all across Miami that when they're looking at buying a home, they are looking at elevation and they're looking to make sure the home is protected. And they're understanding not only will their flood insurance cost more, um, but that they're going to, you know, face possibly some inundation issues. And is that really a wise investment? Instead, should they purchase somewhere where the home is higher, the home is more protected? And I think those conversations are very real and are very happening. A couple quick more questions. Uh, Resilient 305 project, mm -hmm. how would you describe that? Well, um, we initially used to describe it as a three-headed monster, um, <laughs> but lovingly, this is a, an amazing collaboration between Miami Beach, Miami-Dade County, and the city of Miami. Uh, we were selected by the Rockefeller Foundation to develop a regional resilience strategy together. So it was an, exper uh, an experiment for them, um, for the Rockefeller Foundation, for the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative. It was an experience for us, and um, it's been an amazing experience. We went through a couple-year planning process where we convened community leaders, community members to really define our shocks and stresses, and then we created a plan. Um, and the plan has been instrumental. It has our most relevant and top resilience issues in there. And we work on them. We meet at least monthly to talk through our priorities and moving the needle forward. Uh, we have many sort of offshoot meetings all of the time. Uh, we are in constant communication and sharing what each other are doing. And I think it's just been huge because it's formed a bond. It really has taken down the municipal boundaries and we work as staff, we work together on this. One final question. Uh, some folks, I think, want to pull the covers over their head. And although you said, I'm not about doom and gloom, they may feel that way. Uh, this is an enormous issue. It is a crisis. What would your hopeful message be to our viewers about the climate crisis? Mm. <sighs> That's a great question. I think that over history, we have all faced really, really challenging issues. Um, it might be, you know, world peace, a huge one, um, hunger, poverty. We have massive um, issues that we face as a world and that we've faced over time, and this is another one of them. Um, and even though it's scary, it doesn't mean we don't work on it. It doesn't mean we don't care. It doesn't mean that we, you know, put the, put the cover over our eyes. Um, it means we work harder. And I think that's really important that we don't give up. I think there's innovation, incredible innovation that I see every day. And um, I think it, it, will, it will pay off to do that work. And I think it would be a shame just to leave our coastal areas or to you know, make decisions that would be extremely detrimental to families, to you know, institutions. I think the impact of doing nothing is far worse than acting on it. Amy, it's good to know that you're on the front lines and doing all the work. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure.